Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Pastor John from Third Presbyterian Church. You are joining us for our week eight of our Bible study, Amazing Wisdom, Amazing Women. Today we look at Jael, and she's an interesting uh, story and really part of the continuation of the story of Deborah. Before we look exactly at Jael, let's take a look at the backstory that gets us to this point. You remember that last week we looked at Deborah, and we said that Deborah had three hats. She was considered by some as a prophet, by others as a judge of Israel, and she's also mentioned in the Bible as a mom. While all three are important, we certainly look mostly at her role as a judge. You remember that last week we talked about Deborah coming from Ephraim. And you remember this period of judges took place between the time of the prophets, of the leaders like Samuel, to the time of the kings. And remember, the people wanted to be like all the other nations around them, and they wanted a king. But God didn't want a king. God was afraid that they would begin allegiance to the king above God. And so God suggested that they have these judges. These judges came about whenever there was a time when the people had fallen so far away from God that God brought one of these judges into place. And if you look at the chart that I gave you, you see that Deborah is the third, I'm sorry, the fourth judge of Israel, of the, of the Hebrew people at this time. And of course, the map shows you where Ephraim is, and it shows you the whole span of the Hebrew people in the land of Canaan, uh, which of course, as we talked about last week, barely takes up the same square footage uh, as square miles as the state of Maryland. And then we remember that as the story progresses, Jabin is the ruler of the Canaanites and he has a top military commander named Sisera. And they had a very, very powerful army that army had boasted of having 900 chariots of iron. So in order to make those chariots, to get the materials that were needed, the Canaanites would have been in relationship with uh, the, the nations of Egypt, Syria, Moab, and Edom. And the Canaanites were very wealthy. So the Canaanites had this very strong army and they were constantly opposing the Hebrew people. So Deborah becomes this judge at a time when there's huge opposition from Jabin, the Canaanite king, and Sisera, his military leader. Now you remember that Deborah has a military leader by the name of Barak. So if you remember in the story, Deborah decides that she's going to take on Jabin and Sisera and that army of 900 chariots. So she really is looking for Barak to assemble a small group of military folks as more of a decoy, hoping to draw Sisera away from the battle so that Sisera can become assassinated. And in fact, that becomes a prophecy that Deborah has towards the future of how all this is gonna take place. Surprisingly, as the battle wages on, even though the Hebrew people were outnumbered several thousand to one, the Hebrew people wind up winning the battle and that causes Sisera to flee. Now he flees to a place and that's where Jael comes into play. Her name literally means mountain goat and we find out from the text that she's the wife of Heber the Kenite. Let's read along here in Judges 4:17. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the family of Heber the Kenite. The Kenites were from the lineage of Moses' father-in-law Jethro, and they had become a nomadic people, so they lived in this particular land in tents. And those tents were set up mostly throughout the Hebrew people and certainly in the region of Ephraim. Now over history, the Hebrews and the uh, Kenites had a 
a good relationship sometimes, and at other times they had a relationship that was very tense. Right now, it appears that the Kenites had gotten in bed with the Canaanites, and they had a strong relationship, which probably didn't uh, sit too well with the Hebrew people. Now let's read what happens in Judges 4, 18 through 20. Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened up a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand by the doorway of your tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. So what we have here is a situation where Sisera, this great military leader, sees that his army has been defeated. So he flees and he takes refuge and hiding in a tent. And so he tells Jael, after she extends to him hospitality, to stand at the door. And if anyone inquires, simply say, haven't seen him, no one's inside the tent, uh, don't know what you're talking about. This is his ploy for to, to stay hidden because he knows that Deborah is on the hunt for him. Now, Jael uses this hospitality. She tells him to come on in, don't be afraid. She covers him with a blanket. She offers him something to drink and she agrees to stand at the doorway. This is all the makings of a good, hospitable relationship. But now in Judges 4.21, let's see what happens. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. So here is someone that extended hospitality and of course, while he's asleep, she drives a tent peg through his temple. Well, what laws did she break? Well, first of all, she broke the law of hospitality. In those days, when you invited someone to stay with you, you had an obligation to provide means for them, but you also had an obligation to provide safety for them. She broke the law of submission. She was a woman, he was a man. She was supposed to do everything that he asked her to do. And so when he asked her to stand outside the tent, he expected that as a woman, she would do exactly that. And then of course, the third law she breaks is the law of murder, a part of the 10 commandments, part of the law of God. So those would be the arguments in favor of her guilt. But in argument in opposition to that, one could say that she was simply being obedient to Deborah the leader, the judge of the Hebrew people, and in fact, her action is the participation of the fulfillment of Deborah's prophecy. So there are arguments on both sides with respect to Jael. She was simply had an obedience and an allegiance to Deborah, even though she was a different people, and she had a different relationship to Deborah and the Hebrew people than her, sus, her husband Heber had because he had been in relationship and had made an agreement with the Canaanites. Well, let's look at what happens in Judges 4.22. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. Jael is not afraid to tell this leader of the Hebrew army that the person he's after is actually in her tent and is actually dead because of a tent peg through his temple. So in, in a way, she's letting him know that she has been a participant in this process and she was simply following the wishes and the prophecy of Deborah. Now, something kind of interesting and a little bit in the backstory is that these nomadic tribes 
would travel around the arid country of the Holy Land and they would set up tents. And this is kind of a typical tent um, that, that's still actually being set up today from the nomadic groups that travel and inhabit that area. The tents were primarily to protect the individuals from the winds and the sandstorms that would often happen sometimes during the day, but a lot of times during the night. So these tents would be erected and the front would be open uh, when there was not a storm. So what the tent did was it gave coolness inside, but the front was left open so that air could flow in and out of the tent. When a storm approached, whether it was a windstorm or a sandstorm, the front of that tent would be brought down and then everyone inside would be protected from the elements. Now, in most of the nomadic traditions, it was the job of the women to assemble the tent. So they had become very good at assembling tents. And yes, they had become very good at driving in tent pegs. <laughs> now, this particular story raises several questions, some of which are just not answered from the Bible. First of all, the question is, because of what Jael did, how did her husband, Heber, react? Heber is a leader of the Kenites, and he's also in a good relationship with the Canaanites and their leader. Well, what would happen if the Canaanite leader found out that Heber's wife was the one who executed his military leader? I'm sure that relationship would quickly fall apart. And it might even mean that Heber would be put under a death threat. So that's one issue from this story that's unresolved. There's another issue in that when uh, Barak, the leader of the Hebrew people's army, comes to visit Jael, he finds out that she has been responsible for killing Sisera. What was his reaction to that? He's, of course, the military leader in a society where women are not supposed to engage in any kind of military activities. They're not supposed to be physically aggressive on anything. So the question is, what is his reaction to all of this? Once again, the scriptures are silent. But if we look at how Deborah reacts to all of this, the scriptures are not silent. And so let's take a look at what Judges 5, 24 through 26 has to say. And this is part of that thing that we talked about last week called the Song of Deborah. Listen to how it begins. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, most blessed of tent dwelling women. Now that's an important clause that's part of Hebrew theology. To be blessed means to be set apart by God. And so Deborah, for, for all she's concerned about, is willing to say that Jael is being set apart by her God, and that she is being set apart of all the tent dwelling women in the entire land as blessed, being set apart for God. Then of course, Deborah reiterates why. He asked for water and she gave him milk. This is Sisera. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, he, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. So from the perspective of Deborah, Jael is honored by her. And Deborah even calls her the most blessed of women, in fact, the most blessed of the tent dwelling women. So as we kind of bring this look at Jael to a close, as we've done with each one of the women, let's look at what we call the wisdom. So first of all, scripture suggests that she's following her duties as a wife. Then she also su subscribes, and it's implied, that she's in agreement with what Deborah is doing. Now remember, this is a different tribe. This is a different group of people, but yet she's willing to follow the leadership of Deborah. 
we find Jael is a risk taker. The actions that she employs in this story could have very severe consequences. And she's pretty much brave for her actions. If she had been caught anywhere in that process, she would have been immediately executed. And then we read where, at least from Deborah's perspective, she's a woman to be blessed. And of course, she's a woman that takes the situation that she finds herself in and uses it to her advantage. And then finally, her wisdom is that she becomes a warrior, which is highly unusual in the Old Testament for a woman. Now, as we've been doing when we finish the pair of women, we've been asking some questions in comparing the pair. So we find that both of these women are thought of as warriors. Deborah, of course, is a judge. Jael is someone that's kind of behind the scenes, but plays an important warrior role in the assassination of Sisera. So I would like you to think for a second, how are they the same? And yet, how are they different? And then that brings the question, do women need to be warriors today? And in what ways? Maybe not in killing armies or killing individual military leaders, but take a greater look at the word warrior and see whether or not women need to, in their own ways, be warriors in the world today. And one of those examples is number three, both women employ violence against a man. While most in the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament depicts violence in the opposite way. It's always the men who are bringing upon themselves violence against other men and yes, against other women. So how does this unusual twist speak to the role of these two women then? And how does it speak to the role of women today? And specifically in today's world, what would happen when a woman reacts to being abused physically and mentally, and that reaction is a retaliation of something physically? What would happen to her in our particular society? And is she always treated fair for what she does or does not do? And what are the consequences of being abused physically and mentally and never doing anything about it? So those are all kinds of issues that are raised in looking at this study of Deborah and Jael. Next week, we look at a woman named Hannah. And Hannah is depicted as a mother of prayer. And so we will begin to see her important role in making sure that her son is who she wants him to be and she believes God has called him to be. And she does that through a very intense period of prayer. Thank you once again for taking the time to be a part of this Bible study. And we hope that you have a very blessed week and we will see you again next week when we cover Hannah, a mother of prayer.